Hello, thanks for joining me. My name is Paul Garten and I'm sitting here today with two wonderful individuals who know a lot about finances and money. Troy Holland, who's the president and CEO of HIC Financial. Uh, Troy is on Wall Street, so knows a lot about the intricacies of money. I'm also sitting here with A-Rod Womack, and A-Rod Womack is the uh, president and CEO of Positive Push. But again, A-Rod Womack knows a lot about money. Now let's slide right into the topic of money, guys. The stock market is seeing incredible uh, uh, rallies. It's in the midst of a historic rally right now. But yet, you've got folks like Warren Buffett, John Paulson, and George Soros taking their money out of the stock market at the same time that the middle class and upper middle class are dumping money into the stock market. Troy, let's start with you. Well, the stock market has rallied uh, over the last three and a half, four months. Uh, and the big guys know nothing goes straight up. You know, and the stock market has gone straight up. I'm convinced it has more to do with the correlation between the the dollar and the stock market. When the, when the dollar goes down, the stock market goes up. When the stock market goes down, the dollar goes up. Is probably something uh, that could even be, I don't know, even more sinister than that. I mean, the fact is, is that I think a good analogy was made um, a few days ago. I heard somebody say it's like what happens to the animals right before a tsunami hits. All the animals disappear. And then the tsunami, the tsunami comes. Right. And like we didn't know it was so, coming, so but the animals I'm, did. So I'm saying that that Soros and Paulson, and they're like those animals. Or the animals. Yeah, they're because right. yeah, because they're tethered to under to an understanding about markets um, and how they operate, and even certain people who help to 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 dictate what happens in those markets in ways that average people aren't. Uh, Warren <laughs> Warren Buffett, his holding company is Berkshire Hathaway. And Berkshire sold roughly 19 million <coughs> shares of Johnson & Johnson mm. and reduced his overall stake in consumer product stocks by 21%. Berkshire Hathaway also sold its entire, its entire stake in Intel. Now, Buffett's not alone. So his fellow billionaire, John Paulson, um, dumped 14 million shares of J.P. Morgan Chase. Paulson's fund also dumped its entire position and discount retail and family dollars. See, now that's the stuff right there that really is more concerning. But see, <clears throat> it's not as concerning for me as I uh, wait a minute. You say it's concerning. You say it's not. Well, yeah. the reason is is because what do we say? because what's going on. Because if if that were just the case with a particular uh, uh, investor. If, it, if we were just talking about Soros, or if we were just talking about Paulson, right. I would say, yes, Troy, I can understand that. But when you talk about two, three, four, five, ten billionaires mm -hmm. pulling out of the U.S. investment market at the same time, mm -hmm. that's the issue for me. That, that's what's indicative of issue, problem, red flag but goes the up. the market is up a lot. So I mean, so out? why are you pulling out? But because... Okay. You ever heard the term? Sell so high by I mean, but the sell low by is, what is um, it? Uh, what is it? Bulls make money. Oh yeah. Bears make money, but pigs get slaughtered. Pigs get slaughtered. I mean, I did an interview back in October when everybody was afraid that the markets were in turmoil and people were talking about getting out of the markets. I mean, Goldman and all the big boys were telling everybody, "Oh, this is the time to get out of the markets before the election." Since then, we've hit all-time highs. At a certain point, you got to take that money off the table. I mean, even a gambler knows take the money off the table. Yeah, but uh, again, but I would I'm say not saying that, that's the point. Right, but right, but when you take the, the when you take the money off the table, I know I probably would. You know, I wouldn't take the money off the table until I saw it starting to go south. I wouldn't take it off while it's still right. rising. Well, see, here's the thing. It, this is this is the thing. You know. As a fund manager, so yeah. we're not talking as individuals. We're talking about people who are responsible for other people's money, mm -hmm. and they're not just responsible for other people's money. They're competing with other fund managers for those people's money, and the most important thing is the term that's used ahead of the curve. Yeah, you understand? Yeah. So, 
if I'm, my job as a fund manager, I need to be ahead of the curve. I need to do things before they happen. Um, and right now, there, in my opinion, there are better opportunities for growth in, 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 in funds in other investments. So the stock market is at all time highs, mm -hmm. but you've got those gains in just a, a, a short term months. And then you take into fact that there we're expecting an uh, influx of cap hot money. Yeah. Hot money is speculative money coming mm -hmm. into the United States. Yeah. Hot from money China, from everywhere. From Russia, from other hot countries. Hot money is solely speculative money uh -huh. coming into a country. Mm -hmm. So we're expecting a lot of hot money to come into the United States, especially with the problems in the euro. So the fact that we're we've had a really good rally over the last few months and we're expecting a lot of hot money to come into the United States, especially coming from out of the Euro. Those are the kind of things that as a sophisticated fund manager, you look at and you say, it's time to pull some money off the table and it's time to get into some op some other opportunities. You and I talked before that America really is built on a house of cards. Well, America, America is you mean the, from an investment standpoint? With the IOUs that aren't backed by anything. Yeah, well, the, we were bearish on the states. I mean, we were bearish on the states back in 07. When everybody was running into a, to the states, we were looking outside. That's how we ended up with investments in Australia, Hong Kong, Canada, Switzerland, uh, and you name it. Um, however, that's not where we are now. We are bullish, bullish on, on the states. states. Yeah. I think the United States is where the money needs to be. However, um, and I'm not an advisor, mm -hmm. you know, um, however, what we see is the greatest opportunities in the United States and in, in my opinion, um, in the world is investing in our emerging domestic markets. I mean, for years we watched all the big boys go overseas and invest in all the foreign markets, sure. but the emerging domestic markets, those are the markets that's within our community. Right. I mean, if you look at the, in, if you look at the, the, the individuals in the United States that make less than $30,000 a year, their spending power, their consumption power makes them the eighth largest consumer in the world. In the world. I mean, they could be the eighth largest. And most of them look like us. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so when you have that kind of spending power mm -hmm. within a country, then you have to start to look at the emerging domestic market. And that means getting the access to capital to the entrepreneurs that are in those communities. Because those entrepreneurs, that's where you're gonna get your good returns. If I was a fund manager, which I'm not, but if I was a fund manager and I was looking for some good returns, I would not, I would, I would not be in the market that has gone up to all time highs uh, especially in this time right now with the dollar and the situation with the euro, I would be looking at entrepreneurs that are in the communities that can actually satisfy the domestic consumption. That's a good segue because this is a question I want to ask you. And the segue is uh, as as a fund manager. So if, if, if you know if you're a fund manager, like you said, you, you're investing in other people's money. So you you have to be more conservative. You're investing with certain formulas that probably. Ha it forced you to have a ceiling on how much you're going to invest in particular companies, right? But as an individual, as an individual investor who's not investing in other people's money, investing your own money, what's your take on that same company that is looking at, that that is selling for twenty dollars a share, but whose uh, shares have consistently gone up for the last eight months and it's still going up right now? So I started at twenty. I'm at twenty-four. You know, I don't know what the valuations necessarily are. Yeah, I could have done my homework and my research and seen some companies that project a valuation at 26 or 28. Should I, as a private investor, ride that horse or should I get off with that with the big boys who are getting off the horse? Well, here's what I'll tell you. If, and I'm not an advisor. But you can advise me. But I'm, we're having a conversation, but I'm right, not Right, but advisor. you can advise me, Troy. But here's what I would say. I, I'd like for your advice. If I was <laughs> a private investor. Yeah that was a painter full time, yeah. but I'm a private and I'm investing for my retirement privately, yeah. then I would find a professional because I wouldn't be, I mean, it would be kind of like you need ten thousand. You need $10,000 at least. I'm talking about the average Joe. But so you, the, the, you need $10,000, right? To open up an, uh, an account with, with a, a broker. Suppose I don't have $10,000 to open up an account with a broker. 
I don't, I'm not an advisor, so I, I if it was me, yeah, and I had ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars, um, I would seek returns that yielded me at least ten to twelve percent returns, yeah, because in order for you to invest in safe investments right now, you would have to put away almost ten thousand dollars or more a year, a year absolutely. to be a millionaire in 40 years. 40 years yeah. However, if you were able to identify some good high yield investments that were yielding 10 to 12 percent, uh-huh. you could put away that ten thousand dollars one time and get to that 40, I mean to that million dollars within 40 years. Yeah. But Speak- I don't have any, I mean I don't Speaking I wouldn't which, be in the market. Speaking of which, it's a good time to introduce the rule of 72. We talked about that before. Right. It's a real good time to just talk about that now and how it works. But basically, it's, it's, it's an inflection of what you just said. Um, but what happens with the rule of 72 is um, if, you take, if you take the number 72 and you divide the amount of interest that you're making on your money into the number 72, that's how long it takes you to double your money in whatever market, wherever it is. So for instance, if you're getting 6% return on your investment, you're getting 6% return on your investment, um, 6 goes into 72 what? 12 times, I think? Is that what it is? 6 times 12 is 72? That sounds um, about right. Yeah, so the point is it would take 12 years. So if you had $40,000 being invested at 6%, it would take you 12 years to double that $40,000 and make it $80,000. let us flip it around. If you had... Uh, $40,000 and you were investing it and you were getting 12% return, then it would only take you six years to double that money. Six years at, at 12%, it would take you six years for the 40 to become 80. As long as one thing happened, you consistently got 12% return for six years. You would have $80,000 if you didn't touch it. Wow. So, you know, it's an interesting rule that, um, that, that, that can apply to, to Wall Street, it can apply to common investments, but it's just something for folks to just think about and know Rule 72, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I, if I was making suggestions, um, I would encourage more people to consider entrepreneurship, start part-time businesses, I mean, it's, it's, it's not difficult to go out here and, and, and buy low and sell high. I mean, you know, everybody uses everything. So just find something that people need and sell it. Speaking of that, that's a great segue where you're saying, you know, the entrepreneurs should go out and create companies. You know, that there's, a, there's a barrier. There's a, there's a barrier in, inherent in that, and that's access to capital. Now, one of the things that we're seeing is crowdfunding. You know, Kickstarter is really moving. Kickstarter is kicking space. butt. Yeah, Kickstarter is kicking ass. Yeah, pretty, they are. Pretty much. pretty much. Now, I know you're a fan of crowdfunding. Yeah, but yeah. you're not so much a fan of kick uh, of, of crowdfunding. Now, explain your views, uh, Troy, on 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 crowdfunding. Well, I'm actually a fan of crowdfunding, Kickstarter, and all of those, and, and I think it's about time that the government recognized the need for. Uh, the regular entrepreneur to access capital. I, I think that's the key to upward mobility. The problem is the people who make the rules and pass the laws aren't the people who are in need. And what I find is when they make rules and pass laws, they have they don't think them all the way through and they have unintended negative consequences. Um, I think those investment vehicles are fantastic. However, they're incomplete as they stand. Just because anyone can go on there and put up their their opportunity, the opportunity you still need to speak with a professional. Your your opportunity needs to be refined to comply with all the regulations. You know, and, and if you go on there, which you can, you can go right on there right now and put up your opportunity. And what's going to happen is, if you haven't gone the the proper channels, you're going to not be in compliance, and you're going to find yourself in a worse position than you were prior to getting started. Let, let, well, let's talk about the reality of it, because the reality of Kickstarter, and let's use Kickstarter, because really it's the best example. 
um, kick, uh, Kickstarter, and, and I did misquote a little bit, Paul, on the last time we talked. I said 380, it was 280. I went back and double checked. 280 million dollars Kickstarter helped to fund uh, uh, companies last year to the tune of 280 million dollars. The company How netted, they, made? they made 14 million. Um, they they made 14 million, and that's just one guy that started Kickstarter. You know, with a vision. And I did. The point is this that. To date now, Kishar is only about three years old. I haven't heard of any company who's gone, gotten any trouble, uh, f you know, gotten any kind of trouble from funding through that source, through crowdsourcing, through Kickstarter. So, I'm, and I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying that so far, from all the evidence that we've seen, Kickstarter has been not only a brilliant idea, but it's been a brilliant way to bring funding to to folks who who otherwise couldn't find that funding. I agree. It's working. The problem is, and, and it's working till it's not.